And when the big moment came, and they showed me into the room where he was, I found him there lying down on his back, and I said, Dad, what's wrong? And he looked up and he said, well, I have asthma. He had sandbags on his chest and he was exercising his lungs. It wasn't asthma, it turned out to be emphysema caused by his smoking. And I said, does it have anything to do with your smoking? And he denied it. There's R.J. Reynolds saying, you know, denying that the brands that made our family wealthy and powerful were now killing him. I only got to see him about five times after that. And every time I saw my father, he was increasingly sick and frail counting the time that he had left to live. He died when I was 15. That had a lot to do with why I would later, as an adult, turn my back on my heritage and walk away. And why I vowed I would do everything in my power to connect with young people, to empower you to stay tobacco free or quit smoking or using dip tobacco if you are now addicted, because my dad died from this deadly product, even though it made my family wealthy and powerful. The other reason I do it is because as a Reynolds, I discovered I have a great platform to make a difference on the issue. And when I was invited to speak before Congress, when somebody heard I was anti-smoking, I only agreed to testify, and my testimony got front page coverage in a lot of newspapers. It was the first time any tobacco company figure in 1986 had ever spoken out against big tobacco. And even though I never worked in the company or the industry, it was still a tobacco industry family member who was saying no to big tobacco. And I was besieged with a lot of requests for speaking engagements and advocating uh, what were then very controversial, partial smoking bans in restaurants that would set aside an area of a restaurant in a given city. People said, we don't want to change. It's always been this way. The smokers have always smoked in the restaurants, and we don't want to change. Leave those poor smokers alone. Well, we learned that secondhand smoke was causing lung cancer and was causing heart disease among non-smokers who were just inhaling passively nearby. That gave a scientific sound basis for city governments across the country to start banning smoking, no smoking sections in restaurants. Some of the cities started saying, wait a minute, we should just get it out of restaurants altogether. It's so great not having smoking, let's ban it altogether. So the city governments were our first ally. The courts, the judicial branch of government, uh, like the city governments, not corrupted by the tobacco industry's political contributions, were our other big ally. And they passed a $240 billion judgment against big tobacco, payable over 25 years, to recover the costs of Medicare and Medicaid paid out by the states. And then individual claimants began winning. They said for years it's never been proven smoking causes disease. They knew smoking was dangerous, and they hid it from the public. That's why the lawsuits are valid. If you've tried to quit tobacco before and failed, view that not as a message you can't stop, but instead of that, get a message that it's part of the normal journey to becoming a non-tobacco user. It is normal to fail. Most people who use tobacco have failed several times at stopping. And they get back up on their feet and they try again. After you quit, I'm interested in the time that goes by three, four months down the road. Again, a majority of smokers who quit with no program start smoking again within 12 months. If you get in the best programs we have, 85% still fail. That's how hard it is to quit tobacco. It's almost impossible. Same rate of recidivism as heroin or cocaine. And dip tobacco is exactly the same, just as hard to quit. But say you've been off for a week and you've managed to stay off for two weeks. I'm here tonight to promise you that you will get an out of control desire for a smoke. It is coming at you. You're gonna be out with your buddies, your friends, having a couple of uh, beers or whatever, whatever you're allowed to have. And somebody's going to say, I'm going outside. And your friends will say, well, where's uh, Joe going? Well, man, he's going outside for a smoke, man. He smokes. Oh, no, man. Joe smokes. You're kidding. He's a smoker. And you're there listening to this, and you're thinking, I'm going outside, too. Haven't had a cigarette in three months. And you get this out-of-control need, desire for a smoke. Remember five words. Hold on for five minutes and the urge will pass. 
hold on for five minutes and the urge will pass. You can do it. If you do that, you'll stay tobacco free. So with that now, I initiate you into life and I will close my talk with the promise of the coming tobacco free society and it's coming because of you. You guys are the future. You are the reason that we're going to have a tobacco free society. You are role models for the other students in the school. Remember your responsibility. Help us go tobacco free. You are the leaders, whether you realize it or not. Your friends and people who watch you <coughs> copy you. You're all models of ethical leadership for each other and for young kids. Remember your responsibility. And because of you, we will have a tobacco free society. I believe in you. Thank you very, very much.